This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Thank you. Um, John Wettemstedt, Abbot of St. Albans, was an important member of the Circle of Duke Humphrey of Gloucester and he shared Gloucester's enthusiasm for the news ideas which spread from Italy during the first half of the 15th century. His encyclopedic works attest to his acquaintance with the writings of contemporary Italian humanists and to his marked interest in the revival of classical learning. In spite of this, modern scholars have been very reluctant to accord him a place among the representatives of Renaissance culture, pointing, among other things, to his Latin style and his handling of the classical authorities as being essentially medieval. In the following, I shall discuss Wettemstedt's use of one of the texts which came to England from Italy, that is, the Latin translations of Plutarch's life. Between 1400 and 1462, the entire corpus of lives was translated into Latin by such scholars as Jacopo Angeli da Scaperia, Leonardo Bruni, Guarino Veronese and Lapo da Castiglionchia, to name just a few. And hundreds of manuscripts witnessed the enormous popularity of these translations. Wettemstedt was acquainted with a number of the Latin lives, especially those by Bruni, whose works reached England at a very early date on account of his relationship with Humphrey of Gloucester. Bruni had translated the Emilius Paulus, which we shall talk about today, between 1408 and 09, and dedicated his translation to the Venetian noble Pietro Miano, a well-known bibliophile, and from August 1408, Bishop of Vicenza. A copy of the Emilius Paulus is found in the ha Harley manuscript, the 3426 in the British Library, which belonged to Hugh Humphrey and was given to Oxford in 1444. Wetton in his turn, composed a life of Paulus Emilius based on Bruno's translation, and this adaptation of Bruno's text is a telling example of Wettemstedt's attitude towards an understanding of a humanistic text. Born in 1392, John Bostock became known under the name of Wettemstedt after his native village. At Oxford, he attended Gloucester College, the house of the Benedictine of the Southern Province, and around 1414 to 1417, he occupied the priorship of the college. He became abbot of St. Albans in 1420, and in 1423, he was chosen to represent the English Benedictine at the Council of Pavia. He attended the council, which moved to Siena, and visited Rome. During his stay, he probably became acquainted with some Italian humanists, and it seems certain that he visited the Visconti Library at Trevia, since he was later able to quote Leontius Pilatus' translation of the Iliad. Petrus' copy of that rare text was preserved in the Visconti Library at the time. In 1440, he resigned the abbacy, pleading ill health, but he was elected abbot once more in 1452 and ruled until his death in 65. Wettemstedt always retained close connections with Oxford, and he profited greatly from contacts with Gloucester, who was a benefactor of and frequent visitor to St. Albans, where he was druid. Wettemstedt, on the other hand, gave Gloucester several books, including a Cato and a Latin translation of Plato, besides some of his own works. Through his contact with the Duke, Wettemstedt made the acquaintance of the papal collector the Venetian Pierre del Monde, who presented him with some of Plutarch's lives in 1437, and who may have introduced him to the writings of Leonardo Bruni. Wettemstedt wrote some historical works, uh, and he compiled several encyclopedias, mainly during his first abbacy, that is before 1440. We still possess the ones entitled Granarium, Taliarium, and Tabularium Poetarium, whereas the Propinarium and the Manipularium are now lost. The Pabularium, 
which is extended only one manuscript, is a prolegium of Latin poets, both classical and medieval, whereas the Palliarium is a dictionary of classical history and mythology. The Granarium, who concern us here, is the most ambitious of the extant lexica. It was composed after 1439, and in in 1443 and 44, Gloucester had a copy made of it in three volumes. We now possess a complete copy of the letters A to L of the Granarium of the first part of the work, which is in the cotton Neo C6, with only extracts of the remaining letters. And one of the manuscripts contains this, and in other manuscripts in the British Library, the Arendelle 11. The cotton manuscript is written by Whittemstead, and his hand is seen also in the Elden manuscript, some corrections of it. Although this manuscript only contains the selection of the articles, that is the Elden manuscript, of the articles in part one, those included are faithful on abbreviated copies. The entire second part of the work is excellent in a copy corrected by Whittemstead himself, the cotton Tiberius D5, whereas we only have extracts of the third part in the cotton Titus D20. The cotton Nero C6 and Tiberius D5 both derived from the Library of St. Albans. They were later in the library of the mathematician Thomas Allen, who lived at Gloucester College, where Whittemstead was prior. From there, they came into the cotton library and suffered great damage in the fire of 1731. Of the surviving parts of the Granarium, the first two contain a detailed history of historians of all periods and of their works, including articles on Pluta and Leonardo Bruni. The entry on Pluta is based on the so-called Institutio Traiani, first found in John Salisbury's Polycraticus. There are also entries on historical topics and on the heroes of classical antiquity with appropriate moral adages. The extracts extracts of the third part comprise input on mythology, on the lives of saints and classical and medieval authors. Wettenstedt often dedicates more entries to the same person as he does with Emilius Paulus, whose life I'm discussing here. The entries vary greatly in length from a few lines to treatises of about ten pages. <coughs> and they are almost invariably followed by a list of the sources used by or known to Wettenstedt who sometimes even discuss them. His knowledge of both classical and medieval literature is extensive, and among his classical sources, one notices some texts which were rare in the Middle Ages, such as Marshall and Cotillion. Wettenstedt also quotes Latin translations of Homer, Plato, Aristotle, Philosophon, and Plutarch. As already mentioned, Pere del Monte, the Venetian, uh, Pedro Nuncius, presented Wettenstedt with a manuscript of Plutarch, but we do not know which life it contained, and the Montes accompanying letter is not helpful in this respect. Wettenstedt probably had access to the manuscript in Gloucester's possession, and we know that at the time of the composition of the encyclopedia, Gloucester possessed the lives translated by Bruni, those translated by Labu de Castiglionchio, the Romulus of Antonio Beccaria, Marius and Philopidus by Antonio Pacini, and probably the lives donated by, the, by Gloucester to Oxford in 1441, Camillus, Simon and the Collis, Cato the Elder, and Demetrius. On the evidence of the preserved part of the Granarium, we can see that Wettenstedt knew and used all of Bruni's translations, the Antonius, Cato Minor, Rapai, Emilius Paulus, and the Taurus are epitomized in part one, and in part two, we find Demosthenes, we find um, a Demosthenes period and the Cicero novels, which we count as Plutarchian in this respect. Wettenstedt normally acknowledges this with the formula Marcus Velus Martin, Leonardus Aretino, in Illo Parvo di Bellulo, quem di vita aius traduxit ex Plutarco. In a number of instances, Wettenstedt attributes translation to Bruni, which are not by him. In part two of the Granarium, he quotes the life of Cato the Elder and attributed it to Bruni, but it was in fact translated by the Venetian Francesco Barbaro, as we heard a pupil of Guarino, in 1416. 
Westenstedt's actual source here is Petrarch's B.V. Desilutskibus, as it is perhaps in the case of the entry on Metellus Nemedicus of whom Petrarch's pupil, Lombardo de la Cita, published the Vita in a supplement to Petrarch's work. And Westenstedt also attributes to Bruni a translation of the life of Metellus, but as we know, Plutarch never wrote such a work. Other false attributions are a life of Plato, where Wittemstedt probably thinks of the life compiled by Guadino Veronese, which in manuscripts is often described as a translation of Plutarch, and the life of Pompey, which is actually translated by Jacob Wandi as Caperia, the life of Themistocles, which was by Guadino, and the life of Scipio, where the source is probably Petra once more. Although Wittemstedt twice attributed works by Guarino to Bruni, he was aware that Guarino had translated some Plutarchan lives because he mentions him correctly in connection with the life of Caesar and the life of Sulla. Two lives uh, translated by Guarino in 1412 and 1435 respectively. The many false attributions to Bruni may be explained in several ways. Wettenstedt might have heard that translations existed of these lives and took for granted that they were by Bruni since he knew that he translated other lives. Or he might have had a manuscript where these translations were actually attributed to Bruni. Often rubrics where titles, name of translation, translator and a name of a dedicatee of a work would be found were never filled in, and in the case of the life, this caused a great confusion. Accordingly, there is a tendency that the translations were attributed to a famous translator, translator and this would very often be Bruni. One must, however, conclude that Wittemstedt's knowledge of Plutarch's oeuvre was very imprecise. The lemma Plutarchus in part two of the Granarium is further proof of this. Wettenstedt quotes the chapters in Plutarch from German source with Polycraticus as we have heard, but probably using Vincent of Fauvel as an intermediary source. Here, as is well known, Plutarch is the legendary teacher of the Emperor Trajan and the author of the Spurius de Institutione Principis and the Archigrammaton, whereas the historical Plutarch only slowly re-emerges in the Latin West at the end of the 14th century. Wettenstedt reports most of these chapters, but he does add that Plutarch was also the author of a work named De Paribus Concentione Parium, which must refer to the parallel lives. Wettenstedt, of course, knew several single lives, but he does not elsewhere seem to be aware that they belong together. The title De Paribus Concentione Parium may somehow derive from Petra who knew that Plutarch wrote comparisons. It should perhaps be mentioned that in the preserved part of the Granarium, we do not find any traces that Wettens that used the translation of, among others, Vicaria and Largo, which we know when the possession of his friend Gloucester. We now, <coughs> yes, um, in the Arundel manuscript, and this is not that one, this is another beautiful manuscript with an illumination of uh, Bruni's translation of the life of Emilius Emilia Paulus. Uh, but in the Arundel manuscript, we find an <coughs> entry on, or rather, a life of Emilius Paulus. It is called Paulus and thus belongs to the otherwise lost section of part one of the Granarium, <coughs> containing articles on words beginning with the letters M to Z. The entries in the Arundel manuscripts are, as already mentioned, faithful copies of those in Wettenstedt's working copy, the Cotton New York C6, and since they were not burned, they have the additional advantage of being legible. We find other articles on Emilius Paulus in part two of the Granarium and in the Cotton Tiberius C5. The lemma is Emilius. The two articles are very different. In Emilius, which we will not discuss much today, Wettenstedt concentrates on the political career of Emilius Paulus, which he mainly neglects in the Paulus article, as we shall see. And in the Emilius, which must be later, he refers to the article in part one. But now to the entry itself. Uh, here. 
and you have it on your handout, which you cannot read now, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, 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 have, I have just here quoted the uh, part of it which I shall discuss, so you must uh, read the whole of it at the later stage. In the first paragraph of Wessex's entry, we hear that Emilius Paulus was the sign of an ancient patrician family in Rome, descending from a certain Marcus, who was pupil of the philosopher Pythagoras. This Marcus was named Aemilius because of the weakling of his speech, which the Greeks called Aemilian. Wettenstedt's dependence on Bruni is very clear. He not only renders the content, but often also the actual wording of the translation, including Bruni's explanation of the significance of Aemilius quam Emiliam Graeci vocant, which, of course, is not in Plutarch's Greek text. He does, however, change the structure of Bruni's sentences, and he sometimes uses different vocabulary, like primero, which I have underlined here, with the non-classical significance of primum, and the diminutive puerilus for poor. Bruni never translated the first chapter of the Emilius Paulus, which contains a general introduction to the pair Emilius Paulus and Timoleon, so Wettenstedt's epitome starts at the same point as Bruni's translation. Later, the structure of his entry differs a great deal from that of the Protagonist life. Next, we hear that Paulus' father, uh, Lucius Aemilius Paulus, had fought at Canae Alicus Apulia, as Wettenstedt explained on his own account. Plutarch and Bruni leave out the Aemilius of the father's name, but in Valerius Maximus, an author often used by Wittenstedt, the full name is given in the description of the Battle of Cannae. Plutarch merely states that Lucius Paulus was unable to persuade the other consul to abstain from fighting, whereas Wittenstedt does mention the name of Lucius' colleague, Publius Terentius Varus. The, co the consul who fought and died at Cannae was, in fact, Marcus Terentius Varus, whereas Publius, as you know, is the poet. Passing on to the use of Paulus, Wittenstedt omits many of the details reported by Plutus, and although he maintains Bruni's phrasing to a large degree, his subtle alterations reveal a stylistic ideal which differs from that of the Italian. One notice here the use of alliteration, which I have underlined, pubertati pervenient and via morum ingressum, cretus et virtutum. <coughs> in 193 before Christ, Paulus was elected edile amongst 12 candidates in later Augur, Christ, and Consul. In this bare outline of Paulus's curriculum, Wittenstedt shortened Plutarch's narrative considerably, leaving out, among other things, the description of Paulus's intimate knowledge of Aubrey. Up to this point, Wettenstedt's text has been roughly parallel to the Plutarchan life, but in the following, he omits long passages and presents the material in a different order. Using Bruni's words, he mentions the Ligurian War, which took place in the year of Paulus's first consulate, but he leaves out Plutarch's description of the Ligurians, the topography, and the events of the war. In the year of his second consulate, uh, Paulus led the war against Perseus, king of Macedonia, who had revolted against the Romans. The alternative form of the king's name, which you see here, Persis, is not used by Plutarch, but we find it, for instance, in Valerius Maximus and Velius Paterculus. This war, and especially the Battle of Pitna, are undoubtedly the most famous events of Paulus's life, and the description of the battle together with the long digression on the events which preceded the Macedonian Rebellion, form the central part, as well as the dramatic culmination of the Greek life. Wettenstedt, on the other hand, does not enlarge upon the episode, but merely recall that the losses in the two wars, relating the numbers given by Plutarch in the chapters 6 and 21. Once more, Wettenstedt indulges in a night series of alliterations, we have it here. 
No, sorry. Yes, very yes. Uh, we know that the Pacific have it, and it's a patrium at Pasi Prospero Expedo. Evidently, Wettenstedt is much more interested in the meeting between Paulus and Perseus after the defeat of the Macedonian. In fact, the description of Paulus' emotional reactions to the encounter and its small implications is longer than the corresponding passage in Plutarch's life. Perseus throws himself on the ground, embracing the knees of Paulus, who cannot bear the sight of such a gesture of humiliation. Words like procumberet, which you see here, opium, declangeret, castum ipsius, and vulcan in licentem digenerem are direct loans from Bruni's translation, but Wettenstedt expands Bruni's trace and the sentence et quemat modem et cetera de virtute in virtutem uh, per transibat on the moral progress of, Paul, uh, progress of Paul seems to be his personal comment. Although Paulus' excitation to Perseus is once more modelled on Bruni's work, Wettenstedt aspires to a higher stylistic level, a more elaborate phrasing, as we can see already from the repeated, repeated apostrophe noli noli, and from the peoratio, igita virtuose vulto Christem, etc., igita virtuose vulto Christem, which he adds to Plutarch's short speech. Perseus, Paul says, should not accuse fate, but instead comport himself in his misfortunes so that he would seem undeserving of his present, not of his former circumstances. His ignoble behavior marked Paulus's victory. He could not be called a worthy adversary of the Romans if with a broken countenance he would not stand stout in his fortune. The manliness of the defeated foe is revered by his enemy, whereas cowardice, also when it is in luck, will not escape blame. Persia should therefore endure his wretchedness as a man and not show a sad faith in his misfortune in order not to be deemed unworthy of his enemies. Wettenstedt next praises Paulus' lack of grief, which made him ignore the gold of Macedonia and leave Liguria without bringing even one grapnel's worth of silver with him. He was indeed so liberal with money that his estate could hardly repay the dowry of his wife. Plutarch remarks upon Paulus' attitude towards money rather early in the life in connection with the war against the Iberians, which is not even mentioned by Wittemstedt, who in this passage refers to two much later wars. All the same, the verbal similarities between his text and Bruni's translations are sufficient to show that he quotes this passage. But Bruni says that Paulus is sumptuosus, rendering the Greek odakanos. But Wettemstedt talks of his munificentia. I think that this small alteration is a conscious endeavor to represent Paulus's demeanor as more virtuous. Some tuosos could mean lavish, wasteful, extravagant, indicating unnecessary and excessive expenditure. And indeed, we hear that Paulus could hardly repay the dowry of his wife. Munificentia, on the other hand, meaning generosity, liberality, conveys no idea of censure. Paulus' comportment at the death of his two sons about the time of the triumph accorded him after the Macedonian War is described as an example of his strength of character. He addresses the people which mourns for him. Although man should not be terrified at the vicissitude of fortune, it showed divine understanding to assume and especially to dread its mutability in good times. Therefore, the fact that he had always, from the beginning of his journey and to the present time, applauded him with a merry countenance had made him wary of it, and he did not desist in this feeling until a sudden disaster had fallen upon him in his private life. But since fortune now grudged him and his family its former good luck, he began to hope that it would not bear any grudges against the state. Like him, he said to his audience, 
they should, or to the Romans, they should therefore endure his misfortune with equanimity, and for the rest stop their sighs on his advice. Wettenstedt's version of this beast is much shorter than Plutarch, but the parts it does include have been carefully embellished, and although he invariably uses Bruni's words, his style is again much more florid. He adds the formal apostrophe at the beginning, and as we've noticed before, is liberal with alliteration. Quise fortitudinis et versus fortuna, concionem convocans, iam causa consulatis, etc., etc. An alliteration one should bear in mind is not a stylistic device much used by Bruni. On the other hand, Wetton said some, uh, what simplifies uh, Plutarch's account, where we hear that Paul had not just two, but four sons, two of his first marriages who were adopted after divorce, and two by his second wife. One of the younger sons died five days before the trial, according to Plutarch, but four days according to Wettenstedt. Plutarch's chronology agrees with that of Livy, whereas Wettenstedt may here be following either Valerius Maximus or Cicero. Valerius explicitly says that one of Paulus's sons died on the fourth day before the trial, quatum antidium, and Cicero says that Paulus's two sons had died within seven days, that is, one three days after, and the other four days before the trial. In the Greek speech, Paulus describes the Macedonian campaign in great detail, but this part is completely laid out by Wittenstedt, who in other passages too, as we've seen, <coughs> relates only very briefly events of the war. The speech, as recorded by Plutarch, is reminiscent of the one found uh, in Pliny. Valerius Maximus has a short version of it, and Belias Petrus refers to it, but Wittenstedt's text is not dependent on any of these authors. Yeah. Yeah. Thus, in all his deeds, uh, Wittenstedt uh, later sums up, Paulus showed himself no less fortunate than excellent, meriting in every respect uh, great fame. On one point, however, some people thought that he had deserved blame. Without apparent reason, he had divorced his beautiful wife, Papiria, who had borne him a most worthy son, the famous Scipio. But others say that when he was asked about the reason for the divorce, he answered holding out his shoe. Look, though you can see this shoe is fitting and will form, you are not able to tell where it hurts my feet. Thus, according to those, divorcing her for a just but hidden <laughs> reason. In this passage, it seems that the differences between Wettenstedt's text and Bruni's may be due to some misunderstandings. In Bruni's translation, the adjective pulcherimam refers to obulem, whereas Wettenstedt says that Paulus' wife, Papiria, was most beautiful, and most, uh, moreover, that she brought him prolem dignissimam, namely, and that was the most glorious Scipio, thus having two superlatives about Paulus's offspring. In Bruni's translation, we find what could look like two superlatives, Gloriosissimum et Maximum, the last, however, being the name of the second son of Paulus and Papiria, Quintus Maximus, and not yet another attributive to Scipio, as Westerns had probably thought. And it's interesting that in the Harley manuscript, which I've re referred to before, the 3426, which belonged to Gloucester, and is not known to have been in England when Wetterstedt worked on the Granarium, we find the following note in a 15th century hand, opposite the passage in the life of Emilius Paulus. Papiria uxo Emilia fuera. Papiria was the wife of Emilius, and she bought him, she bought Emilia, the most glorious and mighty Scipio. Evidently, the unknown annotator thought that Maximum was an adjective which referred to Scipio and not a proper name. At this point in the Plutarchan life follows the description of Paul's second marriage in which she had two more sons. Wettenstedt mentioned only the first, and he does not make clear that the sons who died at the time of Paul's triumphs 
were not his children by Papiria. A man of blameless son, uh, Paul Sky Wiggins concludes, loved both by his fellow citizens and by his enemies, so that it could be said that <coughs> he had not been without any of the things which pertain to happiness. At his funeral, the best and most happy ornament was not of gold or silver, but the benevolent love and gratefulness which was shown not only by citizens but also by his enemies. For well was in Rome at that time from Liguria or Macedonia, either put themselves under his sparrow or followed behind it, calling him benefactor and upholder of their cities. At the end of the entry is a list of sources, Valerius Maximus, Boethius, and the life of Plutarch, the last one obviously the most important. As we've seen from this short expose, Wesson uh, technique as a compilator seems to be that he chooses one sort, <coughs> and at least in the Plutarch entry, rearranges and embellishes it uh, so that the material found there suit his own purposes. To conclude, I would like to offer some remarks on Wesson as a reader or user of Plutarch as a writer of biography. Plutarch's life, as is well known, uh, represent one of the two original forms of classical biography. On the whole, Plutarch arranges his material chronologically, but his method is not, as he often stresses, that of the historiographer. He wants to reveal the character of the hero, and therefore the significant detail is more interesting to him than a meticulous list of battles. A famous example of his technique is the scene in the Alexander, where the young prince subdues the wife of the Kephalos, and we clearly see the conqueror of the world. In the biographies of Suetonius, we find a different model, which has been called systematic. Suetonius describes the career of the hero until the point where he comes into power. Then he may treat his physical appearance, his various habits and activities, and only then reassume the chronological narrative ending with the death of the hero. Until the 15th century, Suetonius was the more familiar of the two in the Latin West, and he had a notable influ influence both in late antiquity and in the Middle Ages. Master Einhardt used the Vita Augusti as a model for his Vita Caroli Magni, and we find variations of the Suetonian model used for life statements, saints, and writers. Vincent of Bouvet, who was well known to Wittemstedt, included a number of systematic biographies in his speaker of Historial. Here, the chronological narrative would serve as a basis for an enumeration of exemplary deeds and things. And if we return to the Paulus entry, we see that Wittemstedt has constructed exactly such a life. It touches briefly on Paulus's career up to the war with Persia, but the rest of the lemma, which is the longest part by far, is in fact a series of exemplar. The meeting with Persius and Paulus who speaks to the defeated enemy shows his compassion. His behavior in the Ligurian and Macedonian wars is an example of moderation. And his oration to the people after the death of his son reveals mental strength confronted with the blows of fortune. Westminster also reflects on the possibility of a victim, a defect in Paulus's character in connection with his divorce, but he concludes that Paulus was ab anima crimin. <coughs> Students of English humanism, uh, like Roberto Valls, almost unanimously describe Wittemstedt as a medieval writer, whose old-fashioned florid Latin style and unclassical grammar was an embarrassment in a humanist environment and who himself remained uninfluenced by the new learning. This is not totally unjustified, but on the other hand, one must not forget that the works of Wittemstedt represent the first example outside Italy of extensive use being made of the humanist translation of Plutarch. Thank you.